1. A little bit higher, I think. Edward, John 1, Romans 1. There we go. Okay, John 1 and Romans 1. Okay, John chapter 1, verse 14. This is um, a description, a very quick description of Jesus Christ. John 1, 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And then notice, full of grace and truth. Those are... Uh, opposite polars, uh, they are, it's like an oxymoron, grace and truth. Grace is on one side, truth is on the other, but Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Okay, grace and truth. Now, if you would, Romans chapter 1. Okay, grace and truth. The liberals claim to be gracious, and the conservatives claim to be truthful. Okay, so one is on the extreme side here, the other is on the extreme side there. Uh, I would dare say they don't have the truth and they don't have the grace. But even at that, Jesus Christ has both grace. They usually don't go together. Those two, don't, it's like oil and water. But Jesus Christ is a perfect balance of grace and truth. And he wants us to have that grace and truth. Polar opposites, yet Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. In Romans 1.18 Okay, secular uh, people usually will interpret God in the Old Testament as being strict, harsh, okay, and the God of the New Testament is compassionate, gracious, kind, and loving. That's usually how they try to portray him. Okay, they're wrong because God is unchangeable. Okay, Malachi 3, 6, uh, he changes not. Okay, but... Uh, God is incredibly gracious and patient, but there is a limit. He does have a limit. And so I'm going to go with that this morning when God has had enough. In Romans 1 verse 18, before we read this, let's go and pray. Uh, Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words. I pray you'd help us to be faithful to them. Your words help us to understand you better as a result of this and help us to uh, appreciate the grace that you have displayed. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Romans 1.18. Okay, at the beginning, you'll see somebody is holding the truth. So that's good, holding the truth. At the end, in verse 32, somebody's worthy of death. So how do you go from holding the truth to be worthy of death in Romans 1? This is a very quick uh, summary of the world and or society and or an individual who may be holding the truth, but then are worthy of death. And so this is when God has had enough. So Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now that verse changed in every new Bible because the revisers of the new Bibles are holding the truth in unrighteousness. That's the fact there. That's why they change it. Okay, now let's start going down this digression. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things 
of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and God is so that they are without excuse. Okay, God himself is working on every single person. Okay, he is working on everybody outside of our presence. He does want us to witness for him, but God is witnessing on every single person. John 1, 9 says that he has lighted the heart of every man. Now, how you know that is that as soon as that person believes in some form of justice in any way, that is evidence that God has witnessed to them. Okay, that person stole from me. Okay, so what do you want? You want it back? Yes. Okay, that's justice. That is evidence God has manifested himself to you. Doesn't matter if they say atheist or what agnostic. Doesn't matter. Okay, that's evidence. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Step down. But became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Okay, vain in their... They imagine. Well, the young kids are being told these goofy imaginations, and so, you know, a kid, you know, 10 years old, I think I'm a girl, but I was a boy when I was, you know, at the beginning assigned that. Okay, how about this? If you're 40 years old, go to a restaurant and say, I identify as being a senior citizen. Do I get the discount? (laughs) I mean, that'll work. Okay, that's vain in their imaginations. Okay, and their foolish heart was darkened. Then 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Okay, so there's the professor. That's where they get the term. Change and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So there's evolution in reverse. If you read it backwards, creeping things, beasts, birds, man, God. Okay, so what's God's reaction to that? Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now, you don't need the Bible to understand that. Read history. You go back in history and read it, and you'll see nations that do this fall apart. I mean, you've got several examples. Babylon, you've got Greece, you've got uh, Media Persia, you have Rome. Those are simple examples. You have Assyria. Okay, you read from history, they follow the same pattern. Uh, Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. That verse is changed in every new Bible also. Because that's what the revisers are doing. They're changing the truth of God into a lie. And worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. That's the people's reaction. Oh, down there at the dairy farms, they're mistreating little calves. Uh, What are they doing at abortion clinics? Which way, which way are they going to go on that? I'm not justifying either side, but worshiping the creature more than a creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Uh, next verse. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another and to little boys. Okay, you can just get that. Okay, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Okay, notice, 24, God gave them up. 26, God gave them up. 28, God gave them over. That's when God's had enough. He gave up. He's done this throughout history. He's demonstrated this throughout history. Then he starts giving a list. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. Ouch. Ouchie on that one. Maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, 
without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Okay, that's quite a list. If God committed the execution on every one of those violations, how many one of us would be in here right now? Okay, that's quite a list there. They're worthy of death. That's when God has had enough. When God has had enough with a nation or with an individual, it varies, it varies. The wheels of God's justice moves very slowly and mysteriously. God varies those things, even though he is the same. Okay, he changes not. God gave Nebuchadnezzar a grace period of 12 months. But his grandson, Belshazzar, got less than 12 hours. Why the difference? Why does God vary in those things? When God's justice or vengeance come down, it is justifiable and it is proper. When God blew Sodom and Gomorrah off the map, God was right in what he did. He has a right to do that as a creator. So I want to give you a few ideas this morning about the truth when God's patience runs out. God, the God of the Bible is incredibly gracious and patient, just incredible with his grace and truth. Uh, but there does come a limit to his patience. He does have a limit. So first of all, I want to look at the attributes of God, that they are unchangeable. Malachi 3 verse 6, it says, I the Lord, I change not. Now, the main three attributes of God would be going this fat, in this manner, and it has to be in this chronological order. Holy, just, love. That's all through the Bible. Holy, just, love. The first two is what every athlete expects of an umpire and a referee. Holiness, justice. Holiness meaning he's going to obey the rules of the game and he's going to blow the whistle on somebody who doesn't obey the rules of the game. The umpire and the referee is not given in the rules any place that he can forgive an offense. If he did, the fans would go crazy. <laughs> and it's funny, that's what the world wants in an umpire or a referee. Holiness and justice. They don't want forgiveness. Now, in God, when you transfer that to God, they want, oh, love, love, God's love. <laughs> he forgets everybody. That's what they want from that. No, he's holiness first, justice second. Love was manifested at Calvary. Love is by his grace. Okay, now, God is slow to anger, Long-suffering and patience. Now, we'll read some, a few places in the Old Testament so we can verify this. Exodus chapter 34. So when somebody claims that in the Old Testament God was strict and harsh and a disciplinarian and God of the New Testament is compassionate and merciful and love, uh, that is not true. God is the same in both Testaments. Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. Okay, full of both of them. In Exodus 34, God is, um, is, is talking firsthand to Moses. This is the beginning of the nation of Israel. And uh, the Lord passed by, and he's going to demonstrate himself to Moses. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God. Well, then he says this, merciful and gracious, long-suffering. That means suffer long to put up with somebody and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children on the third and fourth generation. That's where his holiness and justice is, and the first aspect would be his love. Exodus 34. Then you got Nehemiah 9, verse 17. Nehemiah. That's that short guy. 
Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17, the last half of the verse. We'll just look at the last half. Nehemiah is bragging about God, and then he says this about God. Okay, at this time, all they knew about the Lord our one is uh, one, the Lord our God is one. They didn't know about Jesus Christ. They didn't know about the Holy Ghost. So he says this, but thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and forsookest them not. Okay, then one more place in the Old Testament, Jonah chapter 4. Ezra, I think, had the greatest uh, national revival and in Ezra chapter 9 and 10, and it began with a bunch of divorce papers. <laughs> okay, uh, Jonah had a greatest citywide revival with Nineveh, but he didn't want, him, he didn't want a revival. He wanted, he wanted God to wipe out these Assyrians. And the reason why he wanted that was twofold is one that he said back home, 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed, and it had gone past the 40 days, and so his name was on, the, on at stake here. And the other was that he knew that Israel was wrong, and if Nineveh gets right, God was going to use Nineveh to destroy Israel, and he didn't want Israel destroyed. So here he was, an evangelist, I guess you could say, uh, preaching to some people that he... When he said, in 40 days you're going to be destroyed, then he sat down and wanted it to happen. He wanted God to destroy them. Why? Because these people have been conquering nations, and when they come in and conquer nations, they torture the people. And history says that they actually skin people alive with pliers, where they would take a plier and grab the skin, rip it down, and then skin this person alive, and all the other atrocities... Jonah wanted God to destroy these people. And uh, in chapter 3, when he came through smelling like whale vomit, okay, he said, 40 days are going to be destroyed, and then sat down was, man, he had his calendar out, oh, 39 days, oh, you going to 38, please, God, let him just try, 37. And, and then the people got together, well, maybe by chance God will repent if we change our ways and Jonah is, oh, oh, please don't do, no, don't do that. No, 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 no. Just, you know, keep going what you're doing. Uh, and in chapter 4, Jonah got mad at God because he pulled his hand off the trigger. He was ready to fire. Pulled his hand off the trigger, and then Jonah's mad about it. Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. He prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarsus, for I knew, I knew, I knew it, that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, repentest thee of evil. Jonah says, I knew that. I didn't want you to do it. I wanted you to fry these people. And uh, he didn't. See, that's the God of the Old Testament. You see, in that case, Jonah would be on the truth side and not on the grace side. <laughs> And in that case, God was on the grace side. But they received a pardon because in chapter 3, verse 9, they fulfilled the qualifications for a pardon. Okay, God in the Old Testament is long-suffering. Okay, if you were, okay, let's say God gave you 24 hours that you can be God. What would you do in 24 hours? Would you say, uh, does that mean I can use a lightning bolt when I wanted to? The Antichrist will be able to do that in the tribulation when he has a nonconformist, exposes him during a public meeting. The Antichrist will say, and he'll fry the guy right in the spot. That will be a very effective tool to convince people as you smell this smoldering body and this hair. The Antichrist has that capability. How many people would be dead if you did get the qualification of God Almighty? I would have to say, you'd have to, you know, come on, you'd put some people in line with that, would you not? Some people are throughout history, some people in America that deserve that, you know, spark. Of course. And, and God has done that 
on occasion or in different methods. He's a God of variety. He has different ways of doing it. But God, it says that he's ready to pardon. So I'm going to give you a few examples throughout the Bible that God has executed somebody. He's either done it through a court structure of Israel, through the death sentence, or he's, there's been times he just said, nah, I think I'll do it. Okay, where it's individually done, or when it gets to be a nation, he kind of he kind of does a little more pizzazz there, I guess you could say. In 1 John chapter 5 says there is a sin unto death. There is a sin unto death. Now, the advantage God has over you and I is God's reading the heart and he reads every motive where we don't have that capability. So if we start in front of the Bible, God put two people in the Garden of Eden and he said, don't you eat of that tree. If you do, you're dead. Well, Eve ate him out of house and home, and so she ate it after probably the serpent ate it. See, watch this, Eve. I'm going to eat it. <laughs> That's good. I'm not dead, so go ahead and try it. You'll be wise. Your eyes will be open. So she ate it, and then Adam shows up. Maybe he's standing there. And he said, why don't you have some, dear? And then he realized, oh, she bit the big one. <laughs> And then he saw that she got some red lips and she started turning a little reddish there in her blush. And, and he said, well, I'm going to show you how much I love you. I'm going to die for you right now. So he took of the fruit and God was looking for him and God was going to execute him. But he said, OK, we got I got a deal for you. If you uh, I'm going to execute this lamb so you don't die today. I'm going to replace it. Why? Because he's gracious. Okay, as you come along in Genesis chapter 20, there's a fellow named Abimelech. Abraham and Sarah comes into town, into the area. Abraham was afraid that these people were going to steal his wife. And so he uh, said to Sarah, hey, would you tell him you're my sister? I mean, you're a half-sister. Come on. I mean, it's, oh, I know it's a half-truth, but they won't get the other half figured out. And so Abimelech, that night he has a dream and God says, you're a dead man. First time the word dead shows up. In other words, you're under the death sentence. Why? Adultery. That was a punishment. Now, he got a pardon because he didn't come through with it. He changed and he sent her back to Abraham. But God gave him a warning. A little later in a chap in a, in the Bible, you have Judah. He has three boys, one named Ur, one named Onan. Ur got married and the Bible says he was wicked in the sight of the Lord and God slew him. That one, God said, I'm going to take care of this one. So God slew him. Then his brother was going to marry the wife because that was kind of a rule and regulation they had. The second born was going to marry her to make up seed for the firstborn. And he committed a eh, kind of a perverted act, I guess you could say. And the Lord said, okay, you're dead. <laughs> slew him right on the spot. Now, when God has these uh, death sentences and these sins on a death, you know the Lord does it executed every single time? He is selective. Okay, and the reason why is God's reading the heart and God is patient and God is long-suffering. God is merciful and God is gracious. But if God executed the death sentence on every single offense that is worthy of death, I think our crowd would be a lot smaller here, and I don't think I'd be standing here. And that's God's grace. As you come along in the Bible in Genesis chapter 15, this guy, uh, I don't know, he was picking up sticks on the Sabbath day, and people caught wind of it, and they found him picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. No Seventh-day Adventist church will follow this. And so... Um, they said, Lord, what do we do with this? This guy's picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. And the Lord says, oh, uh, see that rock right there? Uh, why don't you, a hundred or so of you, pick up those rocks. And, and then he's elected to receive. And so, boom, execution. You see, that's where folks that believe they're going to obey the Sabbath, they don't believe in that part. They're picking and choosing parts of the Bible. A little later, there's a guy named Balaam, and, and he... Uh, 
was paid by Balak to curse the Jews and God didn't want him to curse the Jews and so God wouldn't let him curse the Jews and so Balaam said, here, I got a plan for you. Let's set up a Sadie Hawkins dance and we'll let the Midianites ask the Jewish guys together and have a dance together and then they got intermarried and so they get married on going on there and uh, then judgment time came along and Phineas uh, saw there's a Midianite woman and a Jewish man and oh, oh, um, oh, um, Phineas, he had a different way of getting a point across, and he took a javelin and impaled two of them, death sentence, and God imputed righteousness to Phineas. Now, how about that for a soul winning technique? I'm going to get imputed righteousness. Come on, that's what it said in the Old Testament. Think about that one for a while. And then there was a bunch of... And then there are more people who are going to die. I'll come back to that story. In Joshua chapter 7, <coughs> the Jews come in and conquer Jericho. And they were going to take all the spoils. Now this first battle coming in the land of Canaan is like the first fruits. And so it's like a tithe. And so he said to the Jews, everything you get goes into my temple. Everything goes into my Jewish temple. Well, Achan uh, thought, man, he has enough. He was rich. I mean, Achan was a socialist, and so he wanted to get his own stuff. And so Achan kept a, a wedge of gold, some silver, a Babylonian garment, you know, expensive garment, and uh, hid it in his tent. And then they had a battle. Thirty-six men died because of Achan. And the Lord said, Joshua, what are you praying for? He said, get up. you gotta, you got to have some judgment going on here. And he said, let's do cast some lots. And the lots fell upon Achan. And Joshua said, okay, confess. And Achan said, well, I stole this and that and this and that. And he said, okay, fellas, you guys didn't pick up them rocks? Okay, let's try it again. Execute him on the spot. What was he doing? In essence, he was keeping the tithe. If God executed that one, ooh, ouchie. Okay, and that one. As you come along in the Bible, you have Hopna and Phineas. They were two wicked boys. Now, on those two, God just had them die in battle, but he killed them, Hopna and Phineas. And then you have a guy named Hananiah who was a smart aleck to Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the last prophet of Jerusalem, and Jeremiah was going to, he was giving illustrations of what was going to happen in Jerusalem because they were apostatizing. And Hananiah was doing the exact opposite. And Jeremiah said, okay, we're going to find out who's right. You're going to be dead in less than two years. And a guy died seven months later. Now, that would be pretty effective. God killed him. God had had enough with Hananiah. He had fed up with him. Now, things change in the New Testament. No, they don't. You go to Acts chapter 5. You have two people, a husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira. They sold a piece of property... And uh, they came and brought the, the amount to Peter, and he said, we sold a piece of property for such and such, and we want to give it to the temple. We, I mean, we want to give it to the, the uh, church here. Because, you see, they had saw a lot of people give something to Peter, and, hey, when they gave something to Peter, they kind of got bragged about a little bit, and so they kind of thought, hmm, that would be a good idea. And so, uh, but yet they held back some of the money. Now, there was no sin in holding back some of the non money. The sin was... They claimed, they gave all, and what was their root sin? The root sin was spiritual pretenders. They were pretending to be spiritual. You ever have somebody say, Amen, brother, Amen, Amen, brother, things are wrong, Amen, brother. Kind of putting on a show here, aren't you? If God executed judgment up for everybody who pretended to be spiritual... Ouch. Right? That's right. That's the God of the Bible. In Acts chapter 12, there's a guy named Herod. Herod was giving a big glowing political speech. He was bragging about himself, just like about all of them do. And God killed him on the spot with worms. Now that would have been rather interesting to see how that worked out. In other words, what I'm saying is God has demonstrated execution of justice when he has had enough. If you would, go 1, King, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The God of the Bible is the same yesterday and today forever, and he does have enough. Thank God we're living uh, under his grace. If you're born again, you have his grace. And if God wants to take me out, man, that's just a quick trip to heaven. Thank you very much. 
And you know, I have actually prayed to the Lord on several occasions, God, if I apostatize, if I start preaching false doctrine, would you just do me a favor and kill me? I've actually prayed that. I don't know if he would do it, but I would appreciate it if he did. Why? Because I'd rather be held accountable on the spot than to have to, a bunch of time to deal with all this stuff that I've messed up. Okay, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you kind of use your speed reading skills, you'll see that this is some history for Israel. And these are in samples for us, verse 11, in samples. So this is telling us there is a time where God has had enough. You know, and now God will give several warnings to a nation. God is giving warnings to America, but when he has had enough... There's nothing you and I are going to do about it. Okay, now, if you drop down to verse 7, you'll see 7, 8, 9, 10. Neither, 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 neither. So you have four stories under the Old Testament where God had enough. Okay, and the first one is in, Exodus, in verse 7. That's where, Moses, or that's where Moses was on top of the mountain speaking to God, and God's telling him, giving him some things there. And Aaron... Uh, his brother had, uh, had a bunch of contemporary Jews that wanted to have a contemporary musical service. And so they invited Sandy Patty, you know, Sandy Patty Stein, and, and then Amy Grandy Stein. And so they had this whole thing going on, and they were dancing away, and they had this golden calf. And Moses comes down, and Joshua comes down, and it sounds like we're having a war in the camp, Moses. And Moses says, oh boy, we can't have that. So then they show up. And then they see the nakedness and the dancing. And uh, Moses, God was getting ready to kill two to three million people. He was getting ready to wipe them all out. He had had enough. And Moses said, oh, please, don't, uh, please, God, don't do that. Don't do that. He said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wipe out 3,000. 3,000 people died right like that. Because God had had enough with that 3,000. He had enough with all of them, but Moses interceded. And his prayer saved the life of over 2 million people. That's a prayer warrior. Okay, then in the next story, that's in verse 8, it says 23,000 died in one day. That's the one with the guy impaled the woman and man. 24,000 died in all, 23 in one day. The only one happy that day was the morticians, okay? So they raked in the dough that day. <laughs> And so, uh, 24,000 died in all. There were more going to die if that guy hadn't have done that, impaled those two uh, people. God had had enough. And the next one is verse 9, tempting Christ. You ever tempt Christ? Oh, no, I've never tempted Christ. Well, let me put it this way. Have you ever said to the Lord, God, you're a God of love, and you know, things aren't really going the way I'd like them to go. And since you, if you love me, then you would. That's tempting Christ. Trying to blackmail Christ, trying to manipulate him. Okay, what he did with that one is in Exodus 17, the first time they did that, he just sent an army of Amalek coming in. So they had a war, an unreasonable war. <clears throat> and then he says serpents. And that one, he sent these fiery serpents in and started striking people dead. And that's where Moses made that brass pole and he had a serpent go up that pole. And that's the symbolism of the healing arts. And he got that thing up there. You know, they're copying the Bible no matter if they know it or not. But God had, had enough with those people. And then murmuring, verse 10, murmuring. <clears throat> Aren't you glad nobody murmurs anymore? Murmuring and complaining. Boy, that supper was just pretty. <clears throat> Aren't you glad God doesn't execute judgment on murmuring and complaining? I sure am glad. Because I've done that more than one time. <clears throat> And that one he did take care of a few times. <clears throat> in Numbers chapter 14 through 16, uh, Dotham and Abiram <clears throat> and Korah, they got together and they murmured against God and against Moses. And so God's, you know, when, when it gets to be a pretty big deal, God is sort of kind of uh, spectacular. God has a knack for the spectacular when it gets to be a bunch of people. 
When it's an individual, it's just, you know, here, like one atheist was yelling and screaming at God, you're so big and powerful, I dare you to come down and strike me dead with a lightning. And so, you know, God, he didn't want to, you know, he's just like, ah, oh, he's a puny little nut down there. And he ordered this gnat. The guy choked to death on a gnat. Historical account. Why waste time with lightning when you can use a gnat? Not a big deal. But when it gets to be a bunch of people, God likes the spectacular. So when he had a bunch of people, he, he gave Moses this special little unique button that he could push and the earth opens up its mouth like Pac-Man. And it ate all the, and it, the people fell right into hell, literally. 250 some people. And you know, they didn't turn around and blame Moses for that. Like he had the remote control button. God has a knack. When, it, when he has had enough with people, when it's multitudes, he's got a knack for the spectacular. It's like the special effects in a movie. Men like those things. God likes them too. God got sick of the earth and what the whole world at one time, and he thought, what do I do? I did water once in Genesis. I think I'll do that again. So water comes down six inches per minute for 40 days and 40 nights. If you're going to get it above Mount Everest, 30,000 feet, that's a lot of water. He said, hmm, that's pretty unique. Well, as time marches on, there's Sodom and Gomorrah, and they got their thing going on. The Lord said, boy, I'm sick of this. Mm, oh, it just disgusts my gut. I mean, in fact, the earth is vomiting out in the inhabitants. It makes me so sick. And, uh, oh, there's a lot down there. What's he doing down there? And then Abraham says, Lord, uh, if there's ten righteous people in Sodom, would you destroy it? He said, if you, if you can find ten, I won't destroy it. Four walked out. That's all they had. He let four get out. And the Lord said, well, let's see. I've done water a couple times. Let's try, let's try fire. So all of a sudden, sulfur comes raining down from the sky. And I've got some of that sulfur at my home in a, in a little thing. And that place was a reverse fireworks. The fireworks came down, blew it off the map. And God did right in what he did. Then if you follow the ten plagues, I mean, that's a fabulous thing. Then the Red Sea crossing, then the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 23, he just thought, I'll just send a bunch of hornets in. So these hornets come in. Can you imagine the military records? We had to leave. The hornets were going after us. That's a very effective message. All these little, getting stung right in the face and everything. Uh, In Joshua chapter 10, the Lord said, you know, I like to skip rocks across the water. So he threw some hailstones from heaven down. Boom, you know, boom, boom, like this. And God has a knack for the spectacular. Now, with the Tower of Babel, he wanted to try something different. He didn't want to wipe them out. He just wanted to have a little fun, a little confusion with the Tower of Babel. So you get all the world together. Everybody's all happy. We're all united, you know. We're going to build this uh, tower. Me reaching to heaven. And so the Lord says, nah, let's change your languages. So this Oriel guy's up in a scaffolding. He said, choing, oing, oing, ah, and, and he was saying, throw me up a hammer. And the one below thought he said, hit me with a hammer. So he took the hammer and threw it and hit him. And then they had a big fight. And all this language was going on. I mean, what a, what a very unique method. God is a God of variety. He didn't kill anybody. He just split them up and said, okay, you go east, and you, you go east, and then you will, anyway, what you been doing to me? You go on south, and then uh, you go on over east, or north and east, over to Europe, fellas. That's where we're going to kind of split you people up because you're going to hate each other after a while. And so that's what we're going to, that, that's a pretty good plan. I like that plan. The Lord's got different ways. You know, when a lost sinner, a lot of times a preacher will get preaching expounded. You die, you're going to go to hell, you're going to split hell wide open. No, you're not. A lost person that dies and goes to hell is going to be dropped into hell like a pebble dropped in the Atlantic Ocean. And God is right in doing that. Now, the greatest show is yet to come. You know, usually at the fireworks at the end, you got the grand finale. Wait till you see the grand finale when Jesus Christ comes back. 
200 million man army in the valley of Armageddon. What are they there for? Oh, the Lord's just going to plan. And here comes this chariot coming down on Mount Sinai and it's scooting above the ground about two feet and it's shooting flames out and it's to torch them here, torch them there and he's coming in there whipping around and the, dead, and the blood's going to be up to the horse's bridle. You talk about a grand finale. That's God when he's had enough. But you know that God... Until that grand finale is ready to pardon. He glorifies in pardoning people. When they come to him and, and uh, seek his pardon. Now with Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 5, God said, Jeremiah, <clears throat> you know it's a mess. He said, so in this case, what I'm going to do is, uh, we got three military com campaigns coming in. On the third one, I'm going to have Babylon surround Jerusalem for a year and a half. Now, you know what's going to happen, Jeremiah, so make sure you've got some foodstuffs here. And people are going to run out of food, and they're going to be starving to death, and they're going to eat their own kids. Because, you know, they, come on, they, they don't care for their kids anyway. They've been aborting them like crazy. They've been offering them to Molech, so they're going to eat them. And he said, Jeremiah, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to show you how bad it is. He said, I want you to go to all the Jewish synagogues, and I want you to go to all the political areas. If you can find one, I'm looking for one. If you can find one person who seeks the truth and executes judgment, I will pardon Jerusalem. Just looking for one. He didn't find one. And that's why Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon. If you would, look at Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> I would dare say, if we, if we see how God has done this through history, and then if you're honest about your life, you know sometime in your life, you've committed something that was worthy of death. Sometime in your life. And we have a gracious God. Amen. And you know what? We are not going to understand that grace until we get to heaven. And he brags about his grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. It says this. <clears throat> but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he hath, where he, he hath loved us, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Mercy is, I'm not going to hell. I deserve to go to hell, that's mercy. Grace is, I'm going to heaven. Verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. We're going to start, it's going to start percolating in at the judgment seat of Christ where the Lord's going to say, how about this? I'm going to give you this. I should have done this, but I won't do that. I'm going to do this. Because you relied upon my son. You see, the goodness of God should lead us to repentance. There's a fellow that's in heaven now. <clears throat> I learned a lot of Bible from this man named Peter Ruckman, Dr. Peter Ruckman. <clears throat> he got saved when he was 27. He was a military guy. And he was a pretty rough, vulgar guy before he got saved. Before he got saved, he, he's an artist. He drew a picture of the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper a painting of the Last Supper where all the disciples were drunk, hanging over the table. Jesus was drunk. His eyes were like that. And it was, he thought it was funny, but he showed it to his army men, and they said, Doc Rockman? They said, that ain't funny. He thought it was funny. But even wicked men said, that ain't funny. Well, when Rockman got saved, he got saved... Some churches obviously knew that he was an artist, he was artistic, and so the very one church, the very first church, asked him to paint a picture or painting in the baptistry. So often, like in a baptistry, there's a nice picture. 
when he gets all his uh, paints out, getting ready to paint his picture, the Lord said, do you remember that picture you drew about me at the Last Supper? Ruckman's testimony goes, yeah, I remember that. He says, is there any reason why I shouldn't cut your hands off right now? No, I guess there's no reason why you shouldn't. He said, okay, now paint for me. You know what that is? That's grace. He was worthy, but that's grace. We have a God that's gracious. Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. Now, we obviously mention a lot of truth, and we study as much truth as we can, but we've got to be full of grace and truth, like the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for who you are. Lord Jesus, you are full of grace and truth. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to be people who are seeking the truth, but yet have grace also. Yes, there's times that justice needs to be served. Yes, there are times. And you have demonstrated through history, yes, there's times where you've had enough. But you are ready to pardon. You are ready to pardon. And the Lord Jesus full of grace and truth. Help us to be Christ-like, full of grace and truth. Help us to glorify you for your grace. Thank you for it. We love you for that grace that you have demonstrated. And being born again, man, what a blessing to have that. Well, heads about and eyes are closed. The piano will play. The altar's open if you'd like to use it. It's easy to be out of kilter. Truth. Grace. The Lord wants us to be full of grace and truth. Both. Seeking the guidance of the Spirit to know when we demonstrate grace, when we declare the truth. The grace of God throughout eternity. I don't know what He's going to do, if He's going to whip up scenes or whatever. And He's going to brag about his grace and we get to turn around and brag to him and glorify him about his grace there's no God like the God of the Bible there's no Savior like Jesus Christ none whatsoever Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your long-suffering. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to uh, repent toward thee because of your goodness. Help us to walk with thee because of your goodness. And Lord, I just pray that uh, you just help us to brag about your grace. Glorify your grace. Glorify you who you are. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.